Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and last time we talked about McClernand's role at the Battle of Shiloh and his reserve role at the Siege of Corinth. Now we move with him to Washington, D.C., where he lobbies for an independent command. After Shiloh and Corinth, the Union High Command split up the forces under Ulysses S. Grant to various locations around Tennessee, forcing the Union commander to stretch out the forces he did possess across West Tennessee, the district under his command. This also put Grant on the defensive with no major force to launch an invasion or act aggressively. McClernand sought to get out from under Grant and petitioned politicians and the Union War Department to be given an independent command or be transferred east with McClellan at the head of a corps. While commanding his segment of West Tennessee, he guarded the junction of the Tennessee and Ohio Railroad with the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. In late July, Confederate cavalry under Joseph Wheeler launched a week-long raid with about 500 horsemen into McClernand's area, but the Illinoisan could do little but pursue him with the little cavalry he possessed under his command. For a week, Wheeler burned cotton and railroad bridges, tore up rail lines, and generally raised havoc. McClernand sent numerous dispatches to Grant and Logan apprising them of the location of the Confederate cavalry, but the 60-mile-wide front he was expected to guard with such few troops prevented him from concentrating and stopping the raid. Wheeler made it back into Mississippi relatively unhurt in early August, having caused a great deal of damage. After the raid, McClernand again wrote to Senator Orville Browning to help get he and his men sent to the Eastern Theater. He also wrote to Abraham Lincoln, seeking a leave of absence. Again, McClernand broke the chain of command by bypassing his superiors and communicating directly with the president. Halleck rebuked McClernand for this action, telling him that he violated army regulations. McClernand did not take the warning to heart. Also around this time, McClernand and Grant got into some disagreements, furthering the divide between the two men. A colonel came into McClernand's district and investigated the destruction of government property, a role that McClernand felt was his, not someone from outside his division. Then, allegations of not following orders that would have reduced or stopped the Confederate raid got leveled at McClernand, who fought back against those accusations. When Major General Edward Ord came into McClernand's area in West Tennessee, McClernand asked Grant under whose authority Ord was there. Grant corrected McClernand that his generals did not command territory, but troops, and that all soldiers under the district of West Tennessee were under himself. When Brigadier General James B. McPherson, the superintendent of railroads for Grant, found that McClernand complained to Grant that private goods were being shipped by rail in preference to military stores, McPherson replied that McClernand himself had requested on two occasions for private goods to be shipped by rail and that as superintendent of railroads, he worked diligently to keep private goods from being smuggled on board. In the last sentence of his response to Grant about McClernand, McPherson wrote that he, in future, shall pay no attention to communications or complaints written by officers who know nothing about the circumstances and who misstate facts or attempt to convey false impressions. McClernand now had an enemy in McPherson. At the end of August 1862, McClernand got his wish to return to Illinois under the auspices of helping to recruit more soldiers for the Union war effort and organized troops coming into the ranks. Lincoln called for around 300,000 more troops to fight the war in July, and over 25,000 would come from Illinois. The governor as well as McClernand himself felt he could offer assistance in getting more men to join the war effort. He returned to Illinois a hero and quickly went about sending aides to the congressional districts to help organize the troops mustered into service, giving them training schedules and helping them prepare the officers for what duties would be expected of them in the field. In Springfield, McClernand was given a hero's welcome, and when he went to Chicago to promote enlistment, he made a speech where he said, any commander who relies wholly on strategy must fail. We want the right man to lead us, a man who will appoint a subordinate officer on account of his merits and not because he is a graduate of West Point. Neither Caesar nor Cromwell were graduates of West Point. McClernand found faults with serving under West Pointers and did not like army regulations, at least when it came to the chain of command. He communicated with Lincoln, breaking with army regulations, to make sure he received the credit he deserved. 
he felt that his talents and abilities got lost in the army reports sent through the chain of command. His suspicion of West Pointers is more difficult to understand, but one reason is that he felt they got more of the recognition for their roles in battles than political appointees like him. While in Illinois, he got the opportunity to travel to Washington and meet with cabinet members to discuss the war. In a meeting with himself, Governor Yates, and the Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon Chase, McClernand discussed opening up the Mississippi River and launching a major offensive to do so. The Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, asked Lincoln about the Illinois General, and the President responded that while McClernand was brave and capable, he was too desirous to be independent of everybody else. Nevertheless, McClernand continued to garner political favor for his military strategies for opening up the Mississippi River, which would help out his state of Illinois, since the Confederacy's blocking of the Mississippi River forced Midwestern farmers to sell to eastern markets that now charged a high rate for freight passing by rail and by boat. McClernand even traveled with Lincoln to the Antietam battlefield to visit McClellan. Along the journey and once they returned to Washington, McClernand convinced the cabinet members and the president to give him an independent command. Lincoln gave him orders to organize soldiers in Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa for an expedition to capture Vicksburg, Mississippi. However, the orders conveyed to McClernand gave Grant authority over those troops and put other restrictions on him, so it wasn't exactly an independent command, but McClernand thought himself under the direct authority of Lincoln, not Grant. McClernand left Washington on October 21st, bound for the Midwest to organize the expedition. He began sending troops as they were organized to Memphis to start the expedition. Word came to Grant about such an operation and asked his superior, Henry Halleck, if these troops were under his purview or if they were for some special assignment. Halleck told him, you have command of all troops sent to your department and have permission to fight the enemy where you please. Over the next two months, a series of telegrams and personal discussions between Grant, Sherman, Halleck, Lincoln, Stanton, McClernand, Yates, and Browning as to who commanded the expedition traversed the telegraph wires. Grant and McClernand each thought their authority compromised by the mission of the other. On December 17th, McClernand got word from Secretary of War Stanton that the operations being in General Grant's department, it is designed to organize all the troops of that department in three Army Corps, the first Army Corps to be commanded by you and assigned to the operations on the Mississippi, under the general supervision of the general commanding the department. General Halleck is to issue the order immediately. This reply dashed McClernand's hope of being given an independent command. The next day, McClernand was made aware that he was now in command of the 13th Army Corps under Grant. While in Springfield, McClernand performed a significant and important service to the Union. In about three months, he organized and fielded 52 infantry regiments, five cavalry regiments, and six artillery companies for the upcoming campaign, an enormous feat in such a short amount of time. Miscommunication, or as McClernand believed, conspiracy prevented him from taking command of his forces assembled at Memphis earlier than he did. At the end of December, McClernand departed Illinois for Memphis with his new wife now in tow. He married Minerva Dunlap, the sister of his deceased wife, before he left the state. When he arrived at Memphis, he found the troops he had sent to that location gone with Sherman on the expedition down the Mississippi. He departed Memphis on December 30th to take command of the 13th Army Corps in its actions against Vicksburg.